Bina is brought to you by the Active Aging and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Sia and I am the chairperson for the Active Aging and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Today's seminar, a webinar, will be an hour long with 30 minutes for questions and answers. You can type up your questions and you can also vote questions that are of great interest to you. The next event is tomorrow from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Stepping into a Smart World by the National Library Board. Let me introduce our speakers for today. We have two speakers. The first is Professor Philip Yap. Professor Philip Yap is a senior consultant, geriatrician and palliative care physician in the Department of Geriatric Medicine in Kuti Port Hospital. He's also an adjunct associate professor with the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at NUS and an adjunct clinician scientist with the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at ASTAR. Prof. Philip Yap presently sits on the advisory panels and committees of several organizations, including the Ministry of Health and is also a board member of the RCC Hospice. The second speaker is Ms. Janice Chia. She started Aging Asia to drive and nurture opportunities and the development of innovation and solution that address the evolving needs of rising aging population in the region. She launched several industry initiatives, including Aspire 55 Singapore, it is Asia's first virtual retirement village, a well-being community that offers a combination of social, health and care services. It enables members to continue living in their existing homes. Without much ado, let me hand over to Prof. Philip Yap first, followed by Ms. Janice Chia. Prof. Yap, it's all yours. Thank you, Jeremy, and uh, thank you, everyone, for this, this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts on the frailty and aging and how we, what we can do to prevent ourselves from getting frail prematurely. Uh, let, let me share my slides. Huh? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, I think we all know that uh, we have an aging population with a squaring of the population pyramid, whereby we will have more and more older people uh, in, in, the, in the senior years in our population. So there will be, relatively speaking, younger, uh, less younger people to support old people, which also means that older people uh, will need to remain independent. Right? They, need, they, they cannot be just reliant and dependent on older people. They need to be self-sufficient for as long as possible because there's just not enough young people uh, to care for them. So we could look at older people and classify them uh, by age. And this is what we usually do. So you say we, we, we have young olds from the age of 65 to 74. And then you have the OOs from 75 to 84, and the very O's who are 85 years and above. You could also group them by health and functional status, how well and independent. Some have chronic illnesses and they start to have disabilities like walking disability. And then there are those who are very, very frail, who are on the bed or on the chair all the time and need full-time care. And we realize that um, of course, you know, um, intuitively and logically, more of the younger people are still well and independent and more of the older people, the very old, who are 85 years and above, are frail. However, as one can see from this slide, there are people who are young, in the, in the young old uh, category, who are already very frail. And conversely, there are people who are 85, 90 years old and still well and independent. So age, of course, as we know, is not a good indicator of a person's health and functional status. Some of us may have come across this uh, newspaper article and just in June last year, 2019, which showed that the expected lifespan 
of Singaporeans is actually very, very long, the highest in the world, 84.8. However, it also shows that um, majority of Singaporeans have 74 years of healthy age, which is very high and very high, highest in the world, in fact. Huh? But that also means that the remaining 10 years of their lives are unfortunately spent in not so good health. So as the quote here says, the years that Singaporeans have gained are too often spent coping with age-related health problems. So they may live very long, but they live the last few years of their life on the bed all the time. So this brings to mind the concept of health span and lifespan. So if this is the lifespan of a particular person or group of people, okay, um, we can extend his life and extend his lifespan. So this person would die later compared to this person, right? But this person does not have a good health span because the mobility is set in, that means the illnesses set in early. And although his life is longer now, he spends most of his time suffering from disease. So that is not what we want. If you want to extend life, you also want to extend the number of years that you can live without significant disease and remain relatively healthy and disability free. So this is what we want. Okay, extend health, a lifespan, but also delay the onset of mobility, of illnesses, of complications, of disabilities to shorten this period whereby the person is living in ill health. Now, do you have useful markers of health span and lifespan? For sure, a person's looks cannot really uh, portend what will happen in the years to come. So I think many of us are familiar with Top Gun. And this is, is in 1986, and when Tom Cruise looked this way. And you can see many, many years later, okay, uh, he remains quite good, right? He remains quite looking quite the same. But his co-star, I think it's Kelly McGill's, looks very different now. Okay. So there are functional biomarkers as well as physiological biomarkers. And I think this talk, we will focus mainly on functional biomarkers. These indicators of uh, health span and lifespan that can give us an idea as to how this person is going to do in the later years of his life. So for example, the person's memory, okay, reaction time, verbal fluency can be a marker of his brain, and brain function and brain age. And uh, if it's, it's still very good, then of course, there's a good chance that it will remain good as even as he ages. The person's physical ability, like grip strength, muscle grip strength, okay? Um, muscle movement and coordination time, visual perception, walking speed, BMI, these are also biomarkers, indicators of how he might do in the years to come. So let's look at this example, okay? Uh, these two are different people, and it, it may seem that they, uh, you know, are, are the same, but they are really quite different, as you would see. Okay, they both they both are eighty two years old. Um, they have a history of heart problems, uh, arthritis of the knees, high blood pressure, and they are going for elective knee surgery. Okay, they they have uh, quite severe arthritis of the knees, and therefore they need to replace their knees. The first patient, as you can see, okay, what is he like? He lifts weights, he jogs regularly, in spite of his high blood pressure, in spite of his arthritis, okay, in spite of having some heart problems. And, uh, and because his knee pain got worse, okay, he decided to undergo surgery to replace his knee joint at 82 years of age. The other man, you can see, okay, he's still independent and still able to go out. But now, because of his knee pain and fatigue, he's not able to do so as well, as well as before. And he has a declining memory. Okay. Uh, his surgery was done without much complications, but post-surgery, he became confused and he fell while trying to get out of the bed. He developed incontinence, was not cooperative with physiotherapy, transferred to re a rehabilitation unit, and required four weeks of hospital care and subsequent outpatient rehabilitation to regain some mobility with a walking aid so he could no longer walk uh, himself. 
and he needed people to help him. So both physically and mentally, cognitively, he never quite returned to his pre-surgery uh, status. Why might that be so? That might be so because these at face value, they may appear similar, actually have very different intrinsic capacities. And if you assess them using a frailty scale, okay, the first man possibly lies uh, in category two. Okay? He's well, okay, and he uh, exercises regularly. Okay? He actually goes for jogging regularly. The other man okay, is more likely vulnerable. He's showing some signs of slowing down both physically and cognitively because his memory is also declining. And the point is that people who are, more, who are fitter and more robust than those who are more vulnerable and in fact showing increasing signs of frailty, the people who are fitter will usually do better after a stressor, an event like a surgery or an infection. So as exemplified in this diagram, okay, this uh, category of people are independent and this uh, people who are dependent. For a person who is still fit, as, as shown by the green line, if there's a stressor like an infection or surgery, they may dip a little bit after the, the event, but they recover back to their baseline. But for people who are frail, who are getting more and more frail, as exemplified by this red line, they are functioning just above this cutoff between independence and dependence, okay? And so when you have a stressor that brings them down, even though they recover, they never recover back to what they used to be. And this uh, frailty marker has got also long-term predictability. So this is on the predictability of survival. Okay? People who are more robust with a frailty score of one to three, you see the chances of survival over time, okay, 70 months, much, much higher than people who are frail. Similarly, the probability of institutional care for people who are fitter uh, is, is much less than people who are more frail over time. So how do you know whether a person is frail? You can use this simple eyeballing method, which all of us are capable of. You look at this person, he's very, very thin. He walks very slowly. He looks like when there's a strong wind, he might be blown off balance by the wind. You could you know, have that kind of eyeball assessment. But actually, in the scientific circle, there are, there, there's objective criteria whereby we can uh, definitively define uh, and objectively classify a person as frail. But um, it's important at this point in time to emphasize that frailty is not the same as comorbidity and disability, as you can see here. Okay? A person can be frail, okay, but he may not be disabled. A person can have comorbidities, that means many diseases, arthritis, high blood pressure, diabetes, okay, but he may not be frail. Okay? It's when they intersect, okay? when you have many diseases, you, you have, you're frail, and you are disabled, then you, know, you have this category of disability. And the, the significance or importance of frailty is this. Okay? For a person who is aging very rapidly and enters into frailty, there is a time window okay, before this person descends into disability. When he becomes disabled, then there's really much less that you can do for him. But if you can catch him in this time window, this frailty time window, there's something that you might be able to do for him to delay his descent into disability. And this is what we're going to talk about. So, uh, apart from eyeballing, okay, I mentioned that there, there are some objective criteria we can use, one of which is the frail scale, F-R-A-I-L. Does the person experience fatigue often? Does he have problems with resistance, which means strength? So we ask, can he walk up a flight of stairs unsupported, unaided, without holding to the handrails on his own? Ambulation, can he walk one bus stop distance without any walking aid? Okay. Does he have five or more illnesses or comorbidities? 
has seen significant loss of weight. Usually, we quantify that by saying it's 5 kilograms over six, uh, six months. Okay. If he has three or more components, he is frail. If he has just one or two components, we call this pre-frail, okay? early frailty or pre-frailty. If he's got none of these, he's robust. The prevalence of frailty okay, is about 5% in our Singapore population. Okay? So among say that there are about almost coming to 600,000 older people in Singapore now, about 5% actually are frail. That's about 30 over 1,000 people. It's quite a lot. Then what the, why does this headline say that half of Singapore's elderly are frail? Right? This one is a, a little bit sensationalized because it considered people who were pre-frail. You know just now, the, the, the frail scale, those who scored one to two, they were also included in this assessment. But the point is that there, although the number of frail people is 5%, the number of people who are pre-frail is actually very high. It's like 40%. So we need to be very mindful that there's this group of people that we, if we can catch and identify and do something about, okay, we can delay their decline into frailty. A related concept is sarcopenia, muscle loss. Okay? So it's age-related loss of muscle and strength. And um, what happens is that there's more infiltration of fat into muscle with aging. And so the muscles function and the muscles power will decline with time. So if you look at this, uh, uh, there's age-related loss of muscle mass in males as well as in females. We cannot run away from this. Okay? All of us will experience this. In fact, after the age of 30, all of us will experience some loss of muscle mass. So this is what happens if you compare this, uh, this young lady with the older person. This muscle is repa replaced by fat infiltration. Okay? Similarly, this man and this man, there's some fat infiltration in this older man. But it's not too bad, right? Not too bad. I think I'll just skip this. So how do you screen for uh, sarcopenia? Okay? Age-related loss of muscle mass, which can result in frailty and eventually disability. This simple questionnaire is useful. The SAC F questionnaire. Do you have problems carrying and lifting 10 pounds? 10 pounds is four, four point something, almost five kilograms. It's like a sack of five kilogram rice. Do you have problems lifting it yourself? Do you have problems walking across the room? Do you have problems rising from a chair or bed with, without help? So you can fold your hands and try to sit up, stand up, stand up from the, from the bed or from the chair. Can you do that? Do you have problems climbing a flight of stairs without any support or holding on to the rails? Have you fallen in the past year? And by answering this simple questionnaire, you can ascertain whether you may or may not have the problem of sarcopenia. Now, finally, I want to also go into the cognitive aspects of frailty, mental frailty. Okay, and this is the story of a man who's 75 years old. Okay, he has got, as you can see, uh, many, many comorbidities, many, many illnesses, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart problems, arthritis of the knees, poor hearing, poor vision, has fallen, so on and so forth. And of late, his daughter also notes that he has become more forgetful, repeating himself in questions, misplacing his things. He can still go out on his own, but not beyond the immediate neighborhood. So let's have a look at what this man might look like. his daughter from sleep, right? So because he's not as able-bodied anymore, okay? He's not independent anymore. So he has got physical frailty and he's also showing signs of cognitive frailty. And when we do his test, this is the mocker test which I think has become famous because of President Donald Trump. 
Okay, so Donald Trump scored 30 upon 30 on this test. Now this man, as you can see, made mistakes in this trail making test. He's supposed to join uh, the number one to two to three, but he needs to alternate between the circle and the square. Okay, so he didn't do well here. Couldn't copy the cube. And when he was asked to draw the clock indicating 10 plus 11, he drew this. So he has got clear cognitive deficits. Okay, and uh, five object recall, his memory is no good. We gave him five things to remember. Eventually he recalled none, zero out of five. And his score is 21, okay, way below Donald Trump's 30 upon 30. What's the importance of uh, cognitive frailty? For people who are both physically and cognitively frail, as you can see here, if you are just physically frail, of course, the odds of functional disability with time is higher than the rest. But if you are both physically and cognitively frail, as represented by this bar, you can see the odds of functional disability is 12 times more and the odds of mortality of death is five times more so having a combination of both physical and cognitive frailty is bad news um, okay and having a physical frailty as exemplified by slowing of the gait and cognitive problems will increase one's risk of dementia too so as you can see, the, as represented by the, uh, the blue bar, those who do not have uh, cognitive, uh, this, this uh, motoric cognitive risk syndrome, that means do not have physical frailty, do not have cognitive symptoms, they tend to be, remain dementia-free for longer period of time than those who have. I think I will skip this in the interest of time, just to show that there are many causes of cognitive frailty. It's, uh, 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 something that causes the person to both be mentally and physically frail. And the one I want to emphasize is actually the vascular cause. I mean, we know the brain is actually very richly perfused by blood vessels. And if you have problems with perfusion of the brain because of atherosclerosis and blockages in your arteries, you will end up with cognitive complaints, eventually dementia. And it also has impact on physical frailty because the brain controls physical movements. So if you have a lack of blood supply to the brain, as exemplified by these um, bright white areas, as you can see, they can be very severe. This will lead to not just cognitive impairment, but physical frailty. And also some people get depressed. There's this uh, entity of um, mental frailty, which is depression. And so they start to have falls, they start to decline, they have urinary incontinence. Eventually they are disabled and they end up hospitalized and going to nursing home. Finally, Frailty can also be social. There's a social um, a component to frailty and it's linked to social economic factors. Okay? People who live alone, who have not so good education, who have no good friend or confidant, uh, very frequent social contact, social activities, have got economic uh, and financial deprivation. And these people definitely are at higher risk of social frailty as well as cognitive and physical frailty. So what can you do about frailty? Well, the good news is you can really do something about it. If you catch them during that window period and put them through the appropriate interventions, you can delay their decline into disability. And this is a local study uh, led by Professor Inzikin from NUS. And some of us were privileged to be part of this study. And they had three uh, interventions for this group of people who had very early frailty or pre-fail, you know, just now the scale, frail scale, one to two, that kind of a, a, a patient, a, a person. They were subjected to regular exercise, 90 minutes, two times a week for 12 weeks, followed by home-based exercise. They have regular cognitive training, uh, focusing on improving memory, attention, speed, reasoning, problem solving. And they had fortified nutrition, okay? increasing their overall carbohydrates, fats, and protein. So this is the control arm, and I'm going to show you. This is first the nutrition arm, okay? Uh, this is the baseline. So even the control group, uh, eventually, did, they did improve a little bit, okay? Sometimes, actually, when you put them through a study, and when you assess them regularly, you put them through some of these movements with some attention, you can actually uh, help them because they have more social contact, some, some walking, some exercises in the testing, okay? But in, in those who are exposed to nutrition alone, you can see that their frailty scores drop. 
physical one drop even more. Exercise drop even more. Uh, cognitive training itself did help with frailty, but the best one is the combination of all three. A combination of cognition, cognitive training, nutrition, <clears throat> and physical exercise reduced frailty in after one year most significantly. So this is the value and benefit of exercise. It's a summary diagram. It improves body composition. It can improve your blood pressure. Some of us who have high blood pressure or diabetes eh, will know that if you exercise, sometimes you can reduce your need for medication, diabetic medicine, high blood pressure medicine. Incre increases your physical function and mobility. You get stronger, better immune function with exercise and better li lipid profile and vascular function, better cholesterol levels, fat levels, so on and so forth. Eating well, the Mediterranean diet has been shown not only to be useful for dementia prevention, but also for frailty prevention. So the, the, the uniqueness in this diet is that it is uh, low, relatively lower on carbohydrates. I think those of us who know the food pyramid know that the bottom layer is usually the carbohydrates. Okay? And um, um, uh, here, they replace this with a lot of fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts okay that are rich in omega-3 like uh, olive oil okay uh, walnut flax seeds okay then they have a diet that's high in fish seafood deep sea the, the deep sea fish that are again high in omega-3 the moderate amount of poultry okay and then they have meat as well but not so often but it's important to emphasize for people who are already frail you do need to have protein so meat is still an important and necessary component okay and they drink wine and, um, regularly and uh, it's important also to remember that whatever we do to prevent dementia and frailty we need to take a life course approach it's not only about you know doing the things right when you're old, 70 years old, you got to do it right, right from the beginning. Education reduces the risk of dementia. Okay. Attending to hearing problems reduces the risk of dementia. Uh, avoiding brain injuries, managing and treating hypertension, controlling alcohol intake. Okay. Alcohol is, is unique. Too much is no good. Okay. A little bit can be helpful. Obesity. Avoiding smoking, manage inactivity, diabetes, so on and so forth. So these things are important to address throughout a person's life. So finally, successful aging comprises number one. If we can avoid this a disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, it's, that's the best. If you already have that, control that. Okay. Number two, always maintain a high level of physical and mental function. Physically be active, mentally be active, take on a new hobby. Okay, engage yourself regularly, learning something new, reading. And finally, it's, already, it's also always very necessary and important to remain socially connected and active. Good relationships, good friends, uh, good family ties definitely will help us age more successfully. Okay, I think I, this is the end of my part of the talk. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, um, that was very, very uh, interesting. Um, if you have any questions for uh, Prof, yeah, please type in your questions uh, or vote the questions that are of interest to you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to um, invite the second speaker, Janice, to come online and share with us uh, the active aging in the 21st century. Janice? Hi, thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, it was great hearing from Prof about the um, frailty areas as well. So I really enjoyed that session. What I'm going to do now is share a screen with you so that you can see my slides.
you very much for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to share about uh, today's topic about active aging in the 21st century. And specifically, I'm talking about the building of active aging communities. My name is Janice Chia, Founder and Managing Director of Aging Asia. And I'm also founder of Aspire 55, the first virtual retirement village. So Aging Asia started since 2009 and my experience in the aging sector started about 10 years ago. And in fact, if you think about it, all of us are exposed to the elements of aging from the moment we're born, from the relationships that we have, from the people around me and from the people around all of you. Aging Asia is an industry network that looks at the business of aging. So as an aging market consultancy, we are independent, we're also a social enterprise. And when I started this company, my aim was simply to look at all the good models of aging around the world. How can I introduce it to Singapore? And how can we benefit people who are creating facilities for older people or services for older people so that in future, we, will be, we would have a higher quality of life as we age, the type of places that we live, the type of services we access, and how can we better support baby boomer population, uh, my parents' generation and my generation in future to age better. And this will all be done through development of good partnerships in the industry and encouraging more people to invest in the aging sector. One of the biggest misconceptions about aging when I first joined this industry is that aging is looking at, um, you know, it's for the not-for-profit sector or Aging is only looking at vulnerable seniors. But today we know that aging is not that. Aging is actually a social and economic opportunity in which we can help all older people um, from lower economic to middle to higher income to age better. So let me share with you a clip that um, BBC interviewed some time back that looked at um, how we were looking at active aging in Singapore, taking on the Aspire 55 model. Well, we are halfway through January and some of you might well be into your New Year fitness regimes. Well, how seriously do you really take your health and fitness as you get older like myself? Well, research says we're living longer but not necessarily healthier. Well, a global survey of fitness trends suggests that exercise programs for the older generation are set to be big in 2018. Here in Singapore, some already seem to be ahead of the trend. I've been resisting going to any gym. I'm allergic to exercise. Very tempted to, to live a sedentary, lazy way of life. When I was in my 60s, I found I was falling a lot. Um, I was losing my balance. I took it up as a personal challenge to make sure that I come here twice a week. And my objective actually is to be independent so that even as I age, that I can walk without assistance and I can be flexible so that I don't fall. Dance. You know, it makes me feel very young, dancing, and dancing is something that I really don't do a lot. It's just a whole feeling of fun. I can easily say that um, I'm stronger now than I was 10 years ago. After I've done the exercise, I felt that, well, I have done something. Okay, I gotta keep myself fit. <laughs> With me now is Janice Cha from the consultancy Aging Asia that looks at issues and opportunities facing aging populations in the region. She's also the founder of the gym you just saw there in that report. Janice, Hello. great to have you in the program. Wow, watching all those senior citizens, they're all smiles, they're all very happy. Yeah. How do you keep them motivated? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you have to make them laugh. Mm. I think laughter is the most important. Um, when I look at grandma's generation, they never thought of going to the gyms. But when I said, oh, you know, come, let's have some fun. We have potlucks, we have activities. And then the gym comes uh, along and we have sons and grandsons that exercise together with them. So our trainers are like your children. One for all, all for one. Yes, so that's exactly. how you keep them motivated yes. with a lot of activities. But do they come back? Yes, they come twice a week. 96 times a year, 100% attendance. And we've done that so, so many times. And for these senior citizens, do they just... So if you're interested to view the whole clip, it's also available via the Facebook page that we have either on Aging Asia or Aspire 55. Well... So when, when I look at the aging sector and everything I talk about, it's really not just looking at care. Aging is beyond care. Um, Singapore has outstanding care facilities. If you need healthcare, palliative care, hospice care, home care. I think we, we are really good at serving all these areas uh, when it comes to clinical medical care. Um, what I'm really looking at is how can we introduce that social element, the fun, the laughter, the emotional happiness and wellness. What makes older people happier? How can we improve their quality of life? And through looking at all the ideas from around the world, from how people um, organized activities, exercise programs, services. I believe that we can bring all these ideas together to serve Singapore's aging population. Um, with, with aging impacting all of us and you know, looking at the opportunities that we have here, I think that the, a, a great opportunity lies in the population um, that is pre-frail or pre-hospitalization and you know, you have some chronic issues, but you are not dependent um, on a lot of medical care. And we want to keep people in that active aging um, sector for as long as possible. So you, you could be in this healthy aging component from the age of 50 all the way to 95 and then you know at 96 get a heart attack and pass away um, but you 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 want to keep yourself as um, healthy as longer as possible so today what i'm going to look at is um, four areas that i think can help in terms of helping all of us to develop our own active aging communities um, first one is age with laughter age with health age with purpose and lastly age with communities so what are the key challenges of aging in Singapore? When we look at aging, the lower income has the safety nets of the government to look after them. The middle income will have to pay a little bit and access these services. And it's the, the most important is for the middle income to stay active and healthy so that they can look after themselves, be independent as they age. And then for the higher income, we believe that they have um, different means that they can look after more areas for themselves. But central to all these um, different groups is the issue of loneliness. So loneliness is something that doesn't go across um, our uh, economic strata. You could be very wealthy, but you are very lonely. And loneliness is one of the biggest challenges. Um, the second is looking at the cost of aging. And the third is looking at dementia. So just a preview of um, stats that we have, looking at the cost of residential aged care in Singapore. Um, if you were to live in a six person in a room facility, before subsidies, that would be about $2,000 a month. Um, if you want your own room, there's assisted living to single room facilities in the nursing homes that can range from $5,000 to $10,000 a month. Um, over a 10 year period, um, you can see that this would be a quite a significant cost. So the idea is to reduce the amount of time that we spend in long-term residential care. So try to keep yourself as healthy and mobile as possible and only move to a nursing home if you really have to for the last one to two years of your life. Uh, I think that in future would be the ultimate goal. And for Singapore, it would be for more and more people to be able to age in place, access the home care services, and even down to palliative care services. Today, it's actually possible for you to age in place at home and to pass away at home without having to go to a nursing home because we do have this whole ecosystem of services available. So when you need some services, you might take home care. When you need 24-hour uh, care, then you can hire a nurse in or a caregiver, or if you 
you need hospice care, then you might hire a home hospice care help. And then after that, there are also hospice services if you really need to enter a facility. But the idea is because for services, uh, services in facilities are so expensive, we want to try to avoid it as much as possible if we can. So in future, what do active ages want? Um, you know, from on the picture on the left, that's my grandmother's generation. Um, grandma passed away at about 84 years old. She was healthy all the way till, I would say, three months before she passed away. Three months before she passed away, she realized that she had stage four um, cancer. Um, it was very sudden and she didn't know. One day we brought her into A&E, um, you know, she had some bleeding and she after that, it was a decline from there for three, three months and then she passed away. Um, she passed away peacefully in her sleep. Um, in that three months, she was cognitive well. She was able to communicate with us and she was able to tell us what her needs were. And she even did her own advanced care planning and she, she knew exactly how she wanted to pass. You know, she said, you know, if I, if, you know, if I'm unable to eat anymore, I don't want tube feeding. Um, if, I, if, I, if my heart stops beating, um, I don't want CPR. Um, she, she reached that stage of her life where she, she was very clear about what she wanted um, and she had led a very active life for um, 83 years plus. And when I look at the way grandma's life has been and how healthy and independent she's been all the way to the end, I, I think that's something that many other people would want because you, you want to have your life for as long as possible and to live that life on your own. And this is the life that my parents' generation, the baby boomer generation, envisions in future as well. And that's why more and more people are focusing their lives on being healthy today. So they, they want to be healthy. They want to be independent. Um, when you ask them, do you want to live with your children in future? I can bet you 90% of them will say that, no, I want to live on my own. Um, I want to have my own life. And honestly, as a, as a child, when sometimes when I look after my parents, I would I, I can't help it, but I'll ask them, what time are you coming home? Or, you know, I, I, why are you going out so late? Sometimes children can over-mother their parents as well. And I think that's very, very common. Let me touch on a little bit about aging in place. So if we want to live an active life, it also means that we also want that goal of aging in place. Um, and if you see the key there, central to aging in place is really holding the key and independence to your own life in the comfort of your own home, your independence. You put in all the technologies you need, all the services can be delivered to your house. And you know, instead of spending money on residential aged care in future, maybe you'd spend money on holidays and lifestyle services. But all this is really contingent on being able to build a social interaction model to support your aging in place journey. This social interaction model refers to things like your lifestyle, you know, the friends around you, the activities you have, your community, your neighbors, um, grandma's generation knew all her neighbors. You know, the, the old grandma kampung generation where she'll open the door and she'll talk to everybody. She'll go downstairs and she'll know everyone. My parents' generation will know some neighbors. And maybe my generation onwards, we don't know any neighbors because everywhere we go, our faces are into our phones and we don't really see anyone anymore. And the third one is mobility. Um, how independent and mobile are we um, within one kilometer of where we live, are we able to access um, basic services, hairdressing, food, shopping, supermarketing? Um, I think it's important that we build all these models. Uh, fortunately for Singapore, if you look around us and in all the HDB estates that we have and all the town councils and communities, every little estate is actually one neighborhood. And um, this is what you call um, uh, pro uh, a way of... Uh, aging in place already is already a naturally occurring retirement community in Singapore because every neighborhood is one community on its own that can be self-sufficient down to polyclinics, police stations, hospitals. So just to introduce a little bit more about grandma, I grew up with grandma and I entered the aging sector because of grandma because when I, when I looked at the way grandma was aging 10 years, uh, 10 years um, before she passed, um, I, I realized that there were not a lot of um, things that activities that she could engage in or products that she could do. And 10 years ago, 10 years ago um, there weren't as many services that's so prevalent. And I believe 10 years later, there's going to be even more services. But when I spoke to grandma about aging and I talked about her future aging journey, she would share with me that, you know, she would say, Jan, one day when I'm old, 
I'm, um, you know, just get a helper that will do things for me. And this is different from how my parents said. My parents will be like, no, I want to do things on my own. So that fierce fight for independence. And my grandma said, okay, one day when I grow up frail, um, maybe, you know, I'll end up living in a nursing home for a couple of years and then I'll pass away. But my parents' generation will be, oh no, maybe we'll age in place and we'll just pass away in our own house. So th there are different ideas on it. But mostly grandma's generation would think that as I grow old, someone would look after me. But my parents' generation is when I grow old, I will look after myself. So grandma's generation is where you see that traditional notions of filial piety or xiaoxing. So, you know, the Chinese believe that we want to look after our parents as much as possible. But with this changing generations and, and a mindset shift of the elders from, you know, grandma's generation to my parents' generation to my, uh, my generation in future, we are going to look at that transition of that word xiao from filial piety to xiao as laughter. So making our elders happier and giving them a good quality of life with dignity and purpose and things to do is more important than just having them in your house. So sheltering your parents doesn't mean you are filial. Having them live in the same house doesn't mean you're filial because if we are working so many late hours and we don't even have time to communicate with them, then it's also our job to look at what are the channels for them to find happiness. For example, um, could, could we help them to find mahjong kakis? Could we introduce them to a good um, activity club where they can meet like-minded friends? And I use the word like-minded because we don't like to talk to everyone. We have different personalities and we can't just say, oh, tell grandma to go visit the um, club nearby and she will instantly make friends. Friendships and connections have to be facilitated and that is the challenge um, out there. We have many, many activities in Singapore, but you can do activities um, in a place for 10, 10 weeks and you can still feel lonely because you're not connecting with the people in that activity area. So being able to do activities with like-minded friends is important. And I think some of this can be facilitated by children and family members. If you want your elders to lead a better quality of life as they age and you find that they are lonely and they don't have friends, don't just point them to the nearest place to attend activities. Take the effort to visit that place first, recce the place, find out what they do. Think about, you know, would, would mom or grandma like some of these activities? And then take the time to bring them on the first few sessions of that activity, whether it's a gym class or whether it's an art and craft class or a dancing class, attend that one or two classes with them because that aging journey really resembles the first day of school. Many parents in Singapore would put in a lot of effort in preparing their children for the first day of school. They would research which school they should enter them from one or two years ahead. They would take leave on the first day of school and bring their kids. Um, and before that, they would attend orientation as well. But why is it when it comes to elders and our parents, we don't spend as much effort, but yet that new environment is actually almost the same as a entering primary one kind of environment for students. So as we grow older, of, of course, the next area I'll talk about is how can we be stronger as we age? We have public um, gyms in Singapore. We have private gyms in Singapore. We have clubs in Singapore that have gym facilities. We have playgrounds in Singapore with free exercise equipment. But th for those people who are self-motivated, they will go running every day or go for a walk every day or they'll go to the gym on their own. Um, with Aspire 55, what we tried to do was to look at targeting possibly some people who never experienced exercise before. And we told them that, you know, these are some of the ideas that you can exercise. You will follow, our, you'll follow the trainers in the exercise. And then you would be able to engage them socially and find out, okay, do you, what, what kind of interests do you like? Um, so you find different ways. So it's not just the equipment that motivates people to exercise or saying going to a gym that motivates them. Many people don't like the idea of going to a gym, but um, they like the idea of meeting friends who go to the gym with them or they like the idea of meeting their trainers who are nice, who are friendly. So I would see often that many elders would remember the habits and pastimes or activities of boyfriend or girlfriends of the trainers more than the actual exercise program. So I think these are some factors that make people happy when they, when they work out. So let's think about, well, let's, let's look at here one of our um, 
older person's testimonials, uh, Mrs. Pauline Ong, what does she think about gyms? I hated to go into gym because over there, you know, this modern gym, it goes boom, 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 and all the muscle men and muscle women. And me, a little old lady, I'm 72. My goodness, I feel really uncomfortable until my friend almost dragged me by my nose coming here. But once I'm here, I tell you, it's just a sense of well-being, a sense of comfort, because I know that when I'm here, nobody's going to laugh at me, right? We're all friends. And beside that, there is just so many activities that this founders of this organization has helped us. So it's really what we call a virtual retirement village. It's so small, and yet look at it, it's a village because we have activities outdoors as well as to build up our muscles so that we can go rock climbing, we might go canoeing, not me, but a dragon boat, and we have lots of food and fun. So this is my gym, and I'm very proud to show it off. And what's happened to gyms for seniors because of COVID-19? Um, we, we see that many senior activities have stopped because of COVID-19. Um, and in Singapore, it's actually regulated that seniors cannot share equipment uh, when they enter a gym. So seniors now have to um, either exercise at home or if they go to a facility, they would have to exercise on one-on-one -on -one classes. Um, this is how the environment works. This is a short clip on how the safe environment is now quite different when you are exercising. So the social element is a little bit missing now uh, for that interaction. And we hope, of course, that seniors will be able to exercise in small groups soon in future. Um, but that's just a little bit of an insight into the difference after COVID. And during COVID-19, we found that one of the challenges of engaging seniors in terms of social interaction is um, trying to communicate them because not many people were on Zoom. So actually one thing we need to do if we, if we want to prepare for a new normal is to encourage more older people to take on opportunities to learn how to use Zoom, to go online, to just keep trying, entering meetings, experimenting and creating their own meetings, attending activities, because this, this is a new environment that they have to navigate. 
I mean, I think that if we wanted a digital Singapore for seniors, then maybe one day we might want something like free Wi-Fi for all seniors and or, or free Wi-Fi for the entire country. Maybe that would make the digital adoption curve even faster. So the, the, last, uh, the last few points I'll make is talking about aging with purpose. Um, finding something that you really enjoy and like, and like what Professor men mentioned earlier. Um, looking at activities, like-minded friends, these help to reduce loneliness and, and to, to help us to discover new experiences. Um, here you look at a boat filled with ladies um, trying dragon boat for the first time. Um, one thing I, uh, I've learned about um, older people through my interactions and, and through a lot of the research that we've done is um, the desire for new experiences, but not necessarily repeating those experiences multiple times. So for example, I probably couldn't convince this boat full of women uh, and one or two men to go on a weekly dragon boat practice and then take part in the dragon boat championships in Singapore. But I can convince them to try out dragon boat once a year or twice a year just for fun and do a fun race. Um, same with rock climbing or um, going um, adventure walking or climbing in Nepal or, you know, trying pottery. Many of them do enjoy these new experiences. And I think that's one way to, to widen um, the activities that we have in our lives and to widen the opportunities to meet people who are like-minded. So the last one is looking at age with communities. So with a second family approach, I think that um, we can bring back that kampong feeling into many of the communities we have. Singapore has many aging in place services and structurally we have everything available from medical to housing um, to the social services. But what we need often um, is a second family. So the second family can be the neighbor, the second family can be that friendly um, a boy at a coffee shop whom you see every day that's serving you coffee or you know the, the family doctor that you see nearby or the hairdresser that you see once a month when you do your hair. The second family refers to people in your community that can reach out and extend a hand to you or can be a friend to you and can build a relationship with you over time. Because many of our families are now getting smaller, um, people are having lesser children or people are aging alone. Due to feminization of aging, women are outliving men as well. Um, so, you know, as we grow older, the, the family members that we have around us reduce. So at the same time of making new friends, we should also think about making new friends across multiple generations. So we have friends of all ages. Um, and this is a video that I wanted to share with you. And we'll be featuring about 50 of these active aging videos coming up soon. So I'll share with you more later, but this is just a snapshot. This video was taken um, in 2017 with the Hana, like two year old brunette. And I think showcasing active aging talent around the world So if all of you there aspire maybe to take up a new hobby or to become a gymnast, you could try out um, something new. But um, of course this is done with many many years of training. So she never fails to bring laughter and inspiration when I showcase the video. So that's Johanna. So if you're interested to see more, join us at the World Aging Festival this November where we'll be featuring more videos on uh, active ages from around the world, as well as really interesting sessions on active aging models, uh, dementia models, and new models of elder care. So if you're interested to learn more about aging, you can join our mailing list and we'll send you regular invitations to webinars and activities, especially re re relating to the upcoming World Aging Festival, which is a month long, 2nd to 25th of November. So we hope that you will actively support as well as share this link with your friends. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, thank you, Janice. Participants, if you have questions for Prof. Kedibiab as well as for Janice, can you please type them in or vote the questions that uh, that you, you like to, that has already been uh, typed out. Okay, uh, Prof, we, we have a question for you. Um, the first question we have is, uh, what about sleep component in the context of aging? Okay, yeah. I think uh, sleep does have uh, impact 
on especially the cognitive aspect of aging, cognitive health. Uh, I think we all know that when we sleep poorly, mentally, we don't function well. That's, that's because sleep is necessary in consolidation of memory and learning. So, for example, after today's session, we have all learned something about aging, uh, and we sleep poorly tonight. When actually, when we sleep tonight, a lot of the learning that is going on in the day is consolidated and put into long-term memory. Okay, so if we sleep poorly, then this process of consolidation is not well done. And therefore, what you seem to have acquired today now, you may not really remember very well in a few days' time because you haven't had that benefit of sleep to help in the, the, the learning process. So actually, sleep is very important for, for learning. And of course, we also know that when uh, we sleep poorly, the next day, our minds don't work well. <laughs> the, the processing speed uh, and attention is poor. So, so sleep is, uh, on, on that account, very important. There is a longer-term impact of, of, of poor sleep. People who chronically sleep poorly uh, can suffer from an accumulation of so-called toxic brain proteins uh, like amyloid and tau. And there have been studies to show that uh, sleep, actually during sleep, these toxic brain proteins are being eliminated. So over time, usually many years, if you have poor sleep, there's a higher risk that you may accumulate these uh, harmful brain proteins that will then exert a damaging effect on the brain and increase the risk of cognitive impairment and maybe eventually increase the risk of dementia. So definitely, it's a, sleep is a key yeah, issue in older people, especially with regards to brain health. Okay. There, there are some questions on cognitive training. Do you want me to address that? Yes, please. Um, the next question I have is, can you please tell us more about what is involved in cognitive training? Where can we obtain resources to help, to use to help in this? Okay, okay, yeah. Um, there are different ways in which we can carry out cognitive training. <clears throat> the um, cognitive training per se, if we want to be uh, faithful to the meaning of the word training, refers to domain-specific cognitive training. So, for example, in physical exercise, you, you train different parts. You train muscle strength. You train balance and coordination. You train your aerobic capacity or stamina, right? So, similarly, in brain training, you also can train specific domains of um, brain function, like you can train attention and speed. Right? You can train um, memory. You can train multitasking. You can train language. You can train visual-spatial abilities. So domain-specific cognitive training refers to uh, specific exercises, brain exercises or activities that target these uh, specific areas or domains of brain function. Okay, So that is one aspect of a cognitive training. But there's also general cognitive stimulation. So we call it a cognitive uh, uh, stimulation training, which you can get maybe by participating in a social group Okay, that is doing some group activities together. So that kind of a environment is a cognitively stimulating environment. And what Janice has presented, those social activities or those activities that can involve some learning together, for example, playing some games together, those are actually generally cognitively stimulating activities in the social setup. That can also be helpful. The last area is actually that of cognitive rehabilitation, whereby people um, look at some specific deficits in the brain, maybe after stroke, for example, or even in dementia, and then they try to train that part that is deficient by with a function in mind. That means you know you want to train the brains and that part of it so that you can regain some functional abilities. Okay, so so that's cognitive rehab. That's to, if you go by the definition. I think the question is what resources can we use 
I think specific cognitive training, and I think many of us know that there are online uh, uh, resources available. Some are free, some are paid. Uh, what comes to mind would be things like, um, I think some of you may be familiar with MindWorks. It's an app that was developed by the Masik Polytechnic in collaboration with um, this, uh, Professor Kuru Kurushima or something like that, who was, who was behind the Nintendo Brain Age games. So actually, uh, Thomasic Polytechnic had a collaboration with him and they developed actually a suite of, 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 of cognitive training games for speed, attention, memory, and so on and so forth. So you can just go to Google Play. I'm not sure whether it's available in the, in the in, in iPhone. Eh? But uh, you go Google Play, you just Google uh, MindWorks, the Masik Poly or some Polytechnic or something like that. You, you will get the, the, the link and you can download the app and you can try it out. Then there's also this very useful website. It's uh, called Silver Activities SG or dot SG. And they have very, very generously put a lot, a lot of resources on the website for free. And of course, you can sign, you can pay and you know you can get uh, more of those. But I think the free activities are already quite a lot. And they are suitable for people at the higher level of cognitive function, as well as people who are, there's another question uh, saying the cognitive training on homebound patients, less ambulant. Yeah, even for old people who have dementia, you will find some of these cognitive games uh, useful. And so I think I, I, I suggest you just Google Silver Activities SG and you can check out the, the, the range of uh, 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 games uh, they have online. And then, of course, there are these paid uh, websites at Luminosity, Brain HQ. I think some of you have, uh, are familiar with it. You can pay, subscribe, and you can do cognitive training, and they can give, they can take your, they can record your score, and you know, give you an idea how you are progressing with time. Yeah. Jenny, is there anything uh, that you would like to add uh, on the um, on the part of uh, of uh, cognitive training? Um, we experimented during um, COVID-19 to organize um, cognitive activities for older people. So we developed a um, multi-part series program in which it looked at various elements and through physical and brain exercises um, combining that. So for example, some of the games could be on your screen, you would see... Um, articles appearing on different parts of the screen. So it would be, let's say, it's dengue season now, we're catching mosquitoes. So using your hand reflexes, you'll be catching the mosquitoes at various points. Um, and using a facilitator to teach all these different exercises. Um, we, we found that um, there's varied um, attraction for this. Sometimes we think that many, um, many of them are not so res responsive to cognitive training as compared to physical training because they're not used to the idea um, of exercising the brain. They are used to the idea of exercising the muscles and exercising the brain becomes something that you do only if, you're, if, it's, um, if your, your brain is not functioning as well. But the pre, uh, before it gets frail or before, before you have memory loss to, to think about um, active cognitive training and brain training, like what are the programs out there? We found that this is not so popular yet. It's just something new that being developed. Um, okay, the follow-up to the question uh, is, that, can related. you advise? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, related to it. It's on oh, site sorry, yeah, because what Janice said, uh, what, what Janice said reminded me uh, uh, of, of uh, the importance of the physical aspect to, to brain training or to brain health. So, for example, dancing, music and movement, dancing is very helpful, um, not just from a physical point of view, but from brain point of view. Because when you're, say, dancing, you're learning new steps, that is cognitively stimulating. And um, the, the movements itself, okay, uh, the exercise component can also be helpful to the brain to stimulate neurogenesis and synap more synaptogenesis. Yeah, so, so I think, yeah, so, so brain and movements together actually enhance the training. So, Professor, what do you think about learning new things and learning a new language? Um, do, do these areas all help to stimulate the brain? Like, should we be taking more things as we age? Should we <laughs> take up more programs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I think uh, it, it, it's true that when we say we want to stimulate the brain, we want to expand the brain, uh, it's good to learn something new, learn a new language, learn a new hobby. 
Yeah, but it also has to be something that is of interest to the person. It's, it's, there's no point doing something that he doesn't like because uh, yeah, <laughs> just for the sake of, of brain training or brain health. It's yeah. the same as maybe learning. I think the same principles apply. If you want a child to learn well for the brain to develop, he must be happy learning. He, if he's unhappy and, and grouchy, I don't think he's going to learn well. <laughs> Okay. So what I've learned from um, Professor Kawashima is also um, that prefrontal cortex is um, not really activated when we are watching television. Um, with COVID-19, would you say that more people are watching more TV <laughs> today and it will result in us not really exercising our brains as much? I think there's there's that risk <laughs> if you just watch and yeah not not yeah using your frontal your your, your brain yeah in, in that sense um, yeah the frontal training is brain to actually refers to attention and speed training actually yeah mm. so a lot of his games are focused on on that yeah. there is a question saying that asking about cognitive training for people who are sight challenged. Is there any recommendation? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's true that many of the cognitive training that we provide uh, use of visual stimulus. Okay. Right. Um, let me think. Uh, well, you you may not. Um, I mean, you can actually do some speed and tension training with sound. Okay, so it's like responding to it. So when you, for example, you train attention, you have something appearing on the screen and then you attend to it promptly, right? So in the same way, the stimulus can, be, can come in the form of sound, in the form of sound, so that the stimulus need not be just sight alone. And then the other uh, thing, of course, is that the physical component can still be done in the, in the socially stimulating uh, environment. I think those aspects can still be present. Yeah. Um, maybe this part, I, I, I probably need to give a bit more thought on, yeah, okay. to, to this. Yeah. Mm. What, what about people who have uh, a balance, a balance issue, balance challenge? What about that? The, the, oh, okay. So balance, basically you're talking about, I think the, the question may be referring to balance training. Eh? Not so much balance, people are balanced training, whether you can train them cognitively, I think. Balance can be trained, to a certain extent it can be trained. So basically, balance does depend a lot on, for example, strength okay, and posture stability. So these specific components, uh, people who are in the physiotherapy and exercise uh, 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 um, field, uh, will know how to provide the necessary uh, training for to help in balance, for example. So you, you usually will change train strength, postural stability, uh, reduce sway, as well as reaction time. Because people who are balance challenged, if they have a risk for falling, they need to be also be able to respond quickly enough to kind of uh, correct the the, 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 the the posture to reduce the risk of falls. Yeah, so that it can be balance can be trained. Okay, so balance can be. Um, we don't have many questions coming. Is it if there's any more questions you you like to post to um, Prof as well as to Janice? Can you please type it in? Um, maybe I will ask a question to Prof and Janice. A club like uh, NUSS, okay, um, a, a graduate club, and. Uh, 50% of our members are over 50 years. What can we do as a club, you know, to, um, to engage our members on active aging in, in a way that is not piecemeal, but in a way that is uh, more, more well co coordinated? Uh, any, any ideas or any suggestion? I mean, we, we have piecemeal like dancing, we have piecemeal like uh, walking for better health or mind games and webinars like this. Uh, but should there be a more concerted effort of tying all this together as, as, a, as a program rather than a piecemeal? A question in general. 
think what you can look at is um, so what Aspire has done for some corporate clients is develop proposals where they become the active aging operator that helps to coordinate things that would help social and health engagement for their members. So within it's like a white label solution within other um, uh, corporations to to help plan things um, that's based on healthy aging and um, you know how to help your members to age in better health in future. But that's just one way. Um, I guess on your own, um, you, you probably have your own activity coordinators already, but sometimes it doesn't look at a measured way. So for example, um, Aspire 55 measures their fitness progression every three months with a report. So you get to know how are your improvements like over a year, one year, four reports, and you can bring that to your uh, family doctors or geriatrician and you can compare your status. I, I think what, what the population now likes is the knowledge um, of how they are improving and that little side like, competition with themselves to see the improvement. And I think maybe that particular element in the community, let's say with um, other community public facilities out there, we may not see that level of co um, coordination in terms of the reporting being done on, on their activities um, and, and their improvements. Um, Prof, what do you think? I don't think I have much to add because I think you already, and Janice, you, <laughs> through Aspire 55, you have all these uh, uh, programs actually for active aging. Yeah, it's being able to maybe adopt some of your, the ideas that you have done. Huh? Maybe I, and you guys can try to okay. adopt some of the things that you have done. You have a community actually that is uh, aging actively. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. It's an opportunity to work together and to communicate and to yeah. share some ideas. Probably, yeah. Um, question for Janice. Uh, how much per month is membership fee for Aspire 55? <laughs> or maybe we'll take it off, offline <laughs> on this one, right? Shall, shall we take it offline on this one? Yeah, um, just sent it in the, I sent, sent it in the group chat already. Yeah, okay. Um, prof, um, another question and to Prof and so Janice is, do people with dementia need regular follow-up? And how can the follow-up help, if at all? <laughs> okay. Um, I think first, people with dementia need a diagnosis. So the first thing is uh, whether this person has been diagnosed. Uh, the diagnosis helps in terms of helping the person. I suppose if the person has early dementia and he has retained some insight, it helps him actually plan for himself. It's like any other disease, like if a person has cancer, okay. he would want to know, right? he will, uh, stage four incurable cancer. He wants to know because he wants to know how to live up the rest of his, his, his time. And uh, so there's quite a lot of uh, uh, planning that needs to be done in dementia in terms of looking after your personal affairs and the affairs of your family members and uh, maximizing uh, your years ahead and also doing some things that can help ameliorate decline in dementia. Because while dementia is a progressive uh, illness in that it, it will surely get worse with time. That's the problem with dementia. There's also something that you can do uh, to actually reduce uh, the, the rate of decline and improve quality of life. I think dementia care is very much about improving quality of life. And that can be done not just with medication. In fact, medication's role in dementia care is not a very big component. It's not the primary component. There are medications, of course, they need follow-up because there are these medications that can help to buy you more time. Okay, so the person still deteriorates, but the medication can actually reduce the symptomatic uh, uh, progression of the disease. So medications help. The medications can help with the symptoms of the disease. Many people with dementia are depressed. And they, they lack energy, um, they may have sleep problems, they may have anxiety, they have behavior problems, they may have uh, problems that cause uh, uh, family members to feel stressed. So when there are problems that, that need attention, then definitely they need regular follow-up. And of course, regular follow-up has the benefit of monitoring the progress of the patient. And you would be able to ascertain or know better whether you know, his disease is stable, you know, over one year or is declining? How rapidly is it declining? So that you can bring in the necessary services or help for him, for the person with the disease as well as for, for the family. 
Yeah, there's a follow up for people with dementia includes caring for the caregivers because people with dementia cannot care for themselves. You, the, whatever care you deliver has to be done through the family members. From our experience, when we help um, those with dementia, um, having a routine where they come regularly for their exercise programs um, seems to help them. Always having the same trainer look after them. Um, yes. always meeting the same clubhouse manager that welcomes them. So that the environment um, to be as calm as possible and, and welcoming so that when they come, they feel like this is, this is part of their routine. Uh, I think it helps. I think like a lot of things in life, um, exercise helps us, but it's very difficult to get to the exercise. Um, yeah. You have family members that need to take time off in order to bring loved ones to the exercise program, wait there for them and then bring them home. I think this coordination bit is the hardest to commit to for family members, uh, for their elders. So I think that's one, that's one challenge. Uh, we, we also find that um, good training for people who are helping those with dementia helps. Uh, we, uh, many younger people don't know much about dementia, especially the trainers that we hire. So we find that we have to train them from scratch to, to educate them, take them for courses and to, to help them understand how to look after someone who's coming in with dementia. But from, from experience, right, looking after people with dementia, we, we see that their conditions um, seem to be quite stable over a two to three year period of time, um, as long as they are regularly taking part in the exercises. But whenever there's a lapse, um, for example, during COVID, when some of our dementia clients couldn't come for the exercises, when they came back after three months, we noticed, uh, we noticed the significant um, decline in some of their movements and, and activities. So I, I think that, that was just one observation we saw. I, I think what Janice said is very, very helpful and very true. Um, that we have the same experience during COVID, most of our clinics were suspended. And uh, so for six months or more, I didn't see some of my regular patients. And I, I, I have to say that the majority of them declined from a lack of social engagement. And uh, so what, what, what Janice mentioned about structure, routine, uh, familiarity, uh, these stable elements are very important and necessary for people with dementia. When they stay at home and do nothing, they, they just languish. You know? Yeah, you, we need to bring them into some kind of a regular routine that provides um, a regular engagement and activity, both for the, for the mind, for the body, as well as uh, the social interaction. That helps upkeep their well-being. That's, that's very, really very important. Yeah. Great. Well, um, we don't have any more questions coming from the floor. So I, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Prof. Edebiab, as well as Janice, for taking the time off to share with us. Um, it's really interesting. It's an eye-opener. There's so many things that uh, um, we have learned through the, the hour and a half program. And uh, I think uh, social engagement as well as, uh, you know, um, ability, the windows, ability windows and, and exercises. These are very, very important to keep ourselves fit and healthy. So without much ado, I'd like to say thank you very much to both of you for sharing your, your uh, experiences, your domain expertise with us. And uh, thank you for, for the evening. And, uh, Good night then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.